What is it in the world that makes you stand in awe of God? Maybe it's a spectacular sunset and all the colors are just filling the sky. Maybe it's the northern lights that we seen last month. They were indeed somewhat awesome. Maybe it's a sunny landscape. You know, those snow-capped mountains and they're perfectly reflected on a, on a calm lake. Or, or maybe, maybe, just maybe, it's the, the high-res photo that the, optician, that the optician takes off the back of your eye. And you see it on the big screen and you see the mad detail there. Just a tiny space in the back of your eye, but it's blowing up and it's, you think, that's, that's amazing. All of the little blood vessels and everything there. And you think, Lord, you made this. And you're sort of in awe of that. Maybe you go smaller still and you think about the biochemistry of a living cell and all the things which are going on. What about the, the dawn chorus? Let's say you're away in the tent and the birds wake you up, but you're not annoyed because it's amazing. The noise of them, and they're there and it's beautiful and you, you praise God for it. Or for some people, it's just, you know, one particular animal that they truly love. You know, I, I thank God for making elephants. Yeah, I wonder if you have met, met somebody like that and just love elephants. And they have elephants everywhere, you know. It's on their clothes, it's on their handbag, it's on the walls in the house. But they thank the Lord for it. They're in awe of it. Or maybe, just maybe, it's, it's your new iPhone. And you thank the maker of the maker. You know it was the Lord who gave the skill, the ability, the, all of that, given first of all by God, and now it's in your hand. For David in Psalm 29, it seems like it was a mighty storm that has set his heart racing for the Lord. The thunder, the rain, the wind, the earth shaking, the lightning, all of it. It moves David to praise the Lord for his mighty power and majesty. Paul would later write in Romans 1 that since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. The world, it teems with evidence for God's mighty hand in and over his creation. David said it himself, Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Here in Psalm 29, though, the, the skies have opened. The storm has descended. And David, he, he's wide-eyed and he's open-mouthed. Uh, and he praises the Lord God for his supremacy and all that he sees and hears and feels and he's struck with really one overriding thought God is worthy to be praised verse 2 glory is due to his name but God's glory is such that David believes that every part of creation must stand in awe of God and worship him. In verses 1 and 2, David sees God's sovereignty in heaven. Verses 3 to 9, where we're sort of in the storm with David, he sees the sovereignty of God here on earth. And in verses 10 and 11, David sees the sovereignty of God over mankind, and especially God's own people. But in every sphere, the Lord, he is king, the Lord is supreme. I want us to look at that then tonight, the supremacy of God. First of all, this, the supremacy of God in heaven. The storm of verses 3 to 9 sort of causes David to look up. Uh, we tend to do that, don't we, in a storm. You, you look up to, to see the lightning. Uh, we look up and we see the, the clouds and they're maybe racing past overhead. Or you see the, the branches of the trees and they're being blown around and the leaves and twigs are going everywhere. David looks up higher than all of that. And he sees the Lord enthroned. A 
above it all. He sees the majesty of God in all of it. There is no higher throne. And so David, he sort of gives a summons even to the angels of heaven. In verse 1, give unto the Lord, O ye mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. It's not that the angels can actually give anything to God that he doesn't already have. But they are to recognize God for who he is. That he is the Lord of glory. He is the almighty one. God reigns supreme. And all of his subjects should honor him for who he is. And not just honor. Worship. See, here on earth, honor is to be widespread. Honor your father and your mother. Honor the king. Honor those in authority over you. Honor the law and those who implement it. Honor your teachers. Honor your grandparents. Honor your husband. Honor your wife. Honor. It is a wonderful God-given glue for so many of our relationships here on earth. But worship is something different. It is something higher. It is not to be widespread. Worship is for the Lord God alone. Jesus said so himself, as he quoted from the Old Testament when he was tempted in the wilderness. Luke 4, verse 8. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And so in verse 2, David adds to his summons, give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord. In the beauty of holiness. And the holiness is his. He alone is absolutely and intrinsically holy. In all of his attributes. In all of his words. In all of his actions. The Lord is holy. Gloriously holy. And it is then the delightful duty of all of his creation. To worship him. To draw near to him. And give him praise and honor and worship especially. And that summons to worship. Yes, it was sung by Israel as they sing the psalm together. But it goes to all of God's creatures. Every man, woman and child must worship God. No matter what religion they may be brought up in in this world or none at all. Still it's there. We must worship God for who he is. And every element of creation is under his majesty and his authority. He reigns supreme, majestic in his height. To the extent that even these perfect, sinless, holy angels in the realm of heaven, they must worship the Lord. They must give him glory. And they do. That's what Isaiah saw. Isaiah chapter 6, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple, and above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Those angels, they recognize God's holiness. Yes, they, they too are holy in the sense that they are sinless. They did not fall by the grace of God. They're these perfect creatures. But God alone is holy, holy, holy. Holy in essence. Holy in his character. Holy in every action and word that he utters. The angels, they also see that God's creation full of his glory and from Isaiah 6 we can skip to John 12 verse 41 and we learn that the angels saw the second person of the Trinity it was Christ himself in his pre-incarnate glory that they saw he is supreme co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and with the Holy Spirit but he's the one who's been given He's the one who has been revealed to us. To 
then that when we see God face to face, it will be Christ that we see. The all-glorious, thrice-holy Son of God. The one to whom the sinless angels give their perpetual worship to. Please look up tonight. See his supremacy. See those holy angels worshipping him. And may we bow before him. This command here in the psalm penned by David, may that be our call to worship tonight. And not just tonight, because Christ is worthy of our continuing praise and worship, even when we find ourselves in the storm. Because even there, indeed especially there, Christ is supreme. Secondly, then, we see Christ's supremacy on earth. Uh, his sovereign reign is exercised in the same way that God created the heavens and the earth. Scan down verses 3 to 9. You'll see the voice of the Lord repeated. Uh, verse 3, twice in verse 4. Verse 5, 7, 8, and 9. A perfect seven times in this psalm. He reigns by speaking. As the storm rages about David, he hears the voice of God. Verse 3, his voice is over his creation. Verse 4, his voice is the voice of majesty, for he is the king of all things created. Verse 5, his voice breaks and splinters his creation, even the mighty cedars. They're his, and they are his to break if he so desires. He made them. Verse 6, he makes the mountains skip. Verse 7, he divides the lightning. Verse 8, his voice shakes the wilderness. There, there's no part of creation outside of God's domain. All of creation hears the voice of God. In verse 9, his voice causes the deer to give birth, seemingly here before its time. His voice strips the forest bare. And you can't help but notice that there is a fearful power brought to bear when God speaks over his creation in the storm. It's not just nice sunsets and northern lights and beautiful waterfalls and so on. God's attributes, God's order, God's beauty is glimpsed certainly in such vistas of creation. But in the storm, his voice is louder. He not only has power to create, but he does have power to destroy. And that power includes sovereign authority and majesty, for all creation is his. And as it displays God's glory to mankind in particular, those who are made in the image of God, we are meant to take note not only of the wonder and the beauty and the majesty of God's creative power, but we are also to see that our God is a consuming fire. David sees it, he feels it in the storm. These wonderful things that God created, the waters, the cedars, the mountains, the wilderness, the deer, the forest, they're all his. And yes, he has given man dominion over them all, but that final dominion and power and authority still lie within God himself. And in the storm, God's dominion, it is fearful. It is loud. And it makes David so much more aware of God's power and majesty. In a way that the sunsets just don't do. David doesn't dare question God's actions in the storm. He believes what his ears are telling him. This is God's voice. God is speaking. God is making himself known. And he's speaking uh, in a way that you know, his creation need to hear what he's saying. They need to know that he is supreme. They need to know that he creates and he destroys. That it is the Lord God who gives life and who takes it away. To all of this, David simply says, glory. And all in God's 
temple there in verse 9 that they say the same in God's temple these are those who know something of the presence of God in their own lives because the temple is the place where God made his presence felt that's where God chose specially to meet with his people and for all who know the Lord for all who recognize his voice in the destruction as well as in the creation they bow they bow before the majesty of God and they give him glory that's not always easy it's not easy when God thunders and his voice blasts over the waters when you're in those waters it's not easy when the cedars which are holding up you know the roof in your house they are turned to splinters by the voice, voice of God and life comes crashing down it's not easy when the very ground on which you stand is shaking and things you once held to be so permanent, so solid, so terra firma and it's now shaking beneath your feet it's not easy when the blessings of God are stripped from you like the forest and you're left feeling completely exposed and bare but this is God's world, he created it it is now a fallen world but God still reigns supreme uh, we learn from Job lately that life is hard. Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. But for all who know God, even in the midst of the storm, there is still a submission in their hearts. Even when their hearts are breaking. A submission that says, Glory. Glory. Lord, you reign supreme. Lord, you know what you are doing. And Lord, I hear your voice. Well, you'd rather not be in the storm, of course. But God has you there. It's no mistake. And his voice, it is powerful and majestic and devastating. Sometimes his supremacy is devastating. And you know it. You know it. How can you say glory to the Lord how, how can you say that when the voice of, of God is so devastating and it sounds like it is against you and to help us understand just how the believer can say glory in the storm David gives us the last two verses of this psalm because God is not merely supreme in heaven and on earth his supremacy is especially tailored with loving compassion for his own people. Our third point tonight, God's supremacy with his own people. Verse 10, the Lord sat enthroned at the flood and the Lord sits as king forever. The flood. And if there ever was one storm above all storms, it was the flood of Noah's day. Genesis 7 tells us on that day the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights and the mountains were covered and all flesh died that moved on the earth birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life all that was on the dry land died so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. God created and God destroyed. He is Lord of all of his creation. He is the king supreme over every man, woman and child. He creates, he destroys. But in the flood, even while the voice of God was heard loud in judgment and destruction, 
God was doing something else for his own people. God was saving them alive. God was fulfilling his great work of redemption. Genesis 7 verse 23. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. This is God's pattern in salvation. Redemption through judgment. David, he, he sees it here in this verse. It's something that we need to see. We need to cling to it. When the Lord sits as king forever, he is the king who redeems his people. He is the king who saves. Now, when he saved Noah and his family, you know, he, he didn't take them up to heaven for a year while the flood water waters were there on the earth they were in the midst of it they went through it they were redeemed through the judgment they believed the Lord they obeyed the Lord they built the ark they obeyed the Lord God and got on board on the day that God told them to God shut them in he saved them through judgment The ark that saved was a foreshadowing of the final and forever saviour, the Lord Jesus. He saves through the storm. So come with me to the storm of Calvary. Come and see there the devastation of it. As the saviour cries out in desolation, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Even physically in the world, as Christ speaks his final words from the cross, the veil of the temple torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. But through that devastating storm of Christ's death, the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Matthew 17, verse 52. You see, the devastation that we see there at Calvary, it was not mindless. The storm was not without meaning. His death brought life to the dead. And his death still brings life to all who put their faith in him. The devastating judgment of God fell on Christ as he stood in the place of sinners. By his stripes we are healed. By his death, we are given eternal life. The Lord sat enthroned at that flood. Jesus now sits as king forever, seated now at the right hand of God, not just as the Lord of glory, but also as the saviour of his people. The storm he endured was for us and for our salvation. He is supreme in the salvation of his people. And he loves you tonight, believer. And whatever storm he brings you through, know this. It's not random. It's not mindless. It's not meaningless. He's working for your good. Because he's supreme in every detail of our lives. And so David, he looks upon the Lord here in the storm not, not only with holy fear but with adoration with true thankfulness the supremacy of the Lord in heaven and on earth it is working for the good of his people even amid the storms of life he knows the storm he knows the flood. He knows the devastation. He's there at Calvary. And he knows what his people need when they are suffering too. And that's where David then begins to close in verse 11. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. And how well he knows what we need. Remember, this is the supreme Lord of glory. And he stoops to help me and you. It's 
what he does with his awesome power. It's what he does with his glory. Blesses his people. He sees us where we're at, even before we ever came to know him. He knows that we face that storm of God's wrath and judgment. He knew that we were without strength. We could not save ourselves from hell. So he sent us Jesus. Romans 5 verse 6. When we were still without strength. In due time Christ died for the ungodly. He knows that we didn't have peace with God either. We're born into the world as enemies of God. Born in sin. Unable to lift ourselves out of the muck of sin. So he sent Jesus. Again Romans 5 verses 10 and 11. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life and not only that but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation with no strength to save ourselves with no peace with God but Christ comes and through the storm of Calvary gives us exactly what we need we need saved we need strength we need peace and it's not just a one-off strength and peace the moment we are saved. The blessings continue to be given and given and given to God's people each and every day as we walk with the Savior. The psalm then, it calls us to look up when we're in the storm. When we're tempted to think that God is not good we are reminded from heaven the Lord is gloriously beautiful in his holiness. Whenever we feel the waters are overflowing us, whenever you're feeling overwhelmed with the storm, his voice is over the waters. His voice is powerful and full of majesty. He may break the cedars and divide the fire and shake the mountains and strip the forest but we are reminded from the earth the Lord is glorious in all his deeds in all that he does and he is for his people the storms which he reigns over they're not sent to harm us they're not sent just to, to break us His storms are not sent to punish us. Christ has taken our punishment. His storms are designed to make us look up. And then say with the saints in heaven. Glory. Glory. In the storm as we bow before his might and his majesty. He would have us know. I will strengthen you. I will bless you. I will give you peace. David knew it in his own experience. He writes a song about it. He wants them to know it too. Many of them maybe were going through storms just as he was. Others maybe not yet, but he wants them to be prepared for when that storm breaks. And Isaiah, he knew it too in his day. So I want to close with his words from Isaiah 43. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. Amen. Let's pray, please. Lord God in heaven, bless you for your word. We pray, Lord, that whether we're in the storm right now or not, you would give us the grace to look up, to 
see the Lord seated upon his throne, the one who is all gloriously holy, the one who is beautifully holy in everything that he does. Lord, that we would also see that you are on the other side of the flood now. That Christ has come. He has suffered that devastating wrath of God for us. And so he's there now, not only as the supreme Lord, but as the only Savior. And the one who is pleased to strengthen his people and to bless his people with peace. Help us, dear God, please, to look up and ever unto Jesus. And may we be blessed, please, with his strength and his peace. Because we ask it in his name.